Okay, yes, there, that's much better. Well, I want to invite you to pray with me as we open our worship service. Good and gracious God, we come today to praise and worship you, to remember that this is the day the Lord has made and that we shall rejoice in it. Lord, we bring our burdens and heaviness and we lay them down that we may be risen with lightness of spirit as our Lord was risen. In Jesus' name, amen. One note in our order of service, uh, the curie has changed, so please note uh, the cantor will sing curie eleison, and then the congregation will sing the parts, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. So that will be uh, different today. Let us begin with the brief order of confession and forgiveness. I invite you to please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one who fashions us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Amen. Trusting God's promises of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. And take a moment of silent reflection. Source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough to hear your word of love freely given to us, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, stir us, reform us to be a church powered by love willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. God hears our cries and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional. And we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Take this time to share a sign of peace with one another.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
The first lesson is from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? As parents, the parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet, you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness that they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life, because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed. They, sure, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. trusted all the day long. Remember all your compassion and love. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O oh Lord. The second lesson is from Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. 
Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became, an o- and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him and as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why, did you, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated, and I invite the kids to come forward. Bright and early. Good to see your faces. Well, today I'm going to do a little audition. And we're going to pick out who's going to be the catcher for our church. Who's going to be the ball catcher? Oh, no, no. I, got, I actually have some volunteers out here, so we're going to give them a try. All right? You guys are the judges. 
you're going to decide who's a better catcher. All right, so I'll have my first volunteer stand up. Yeah, that's, you, okay, and, and so Carl, he thinks he's pretty qualified here, and are, are you ready, Carl? I'm ready. Okay, here he comes. Oh, I wasn't ready. Uh, <laughs> try it again. You're farther away than I thought. <laughs> oh. No, okay, I have a second volunteer. All right. Why do you think you're qualified to be a catcher? I actually don't. I, I thought I should. I'm not very good at catching. Oh. Do you, are, are you ready to catch? No, I'm not. Okay. She caught it. So who is our better catcher? Right. Only she said she wasn't a catcher, and he said he was a catcher, but then he didn't catch it, right? Yeah. Well, it's... Like our story today, the parable, Jesus uses a story about two, a, a farmer's two sons. And the farmer tells the one, go out in the field and work. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. And then he changes his mind and he does it. And the other son says, yeah, I'll do it. And then he never goes out and does the work. And Jesus uses um, this story to uh, uh, show us that we can trust Jesus. So here's the thing. There's people who say they're going to do something, and then they don't do it. And then there's others who say they're not going to do it, and then they do. And he was emphasizing how you got to watch actions. What do people really do? But what's not in the story is the third type of person, and that's what Jesus is. He's the third type of person, the one that says, yeah, I'll go do it, and then does it. And that's where I mean this story is about how we can actually trust Jesus. He's not like the two examples. He's the type that's going to catch the ball if he says he catches the ball. The type who's going to go out in the field and go do that work. And when Jesus says, come, follow me, we can trust. We can trust to do that and, uh, and know that he means what he's saying. So let's say a prayer. You guys are going to repeat after me, everybody. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who teaches us about you and then actually does what he teaches. Amen. Thanks. So I'm going to start my sermon with a reference to a commercial some of you may have seen in your lives, some of you may have never taken notice of. Um, It's for the drink V8, the vegetable juice. And the commercial usually goes, they usually have kind of the same, similar type of commercial. And it goes something like someone's drinking a V8 vegetable juice and they walk by someone else who's eating a carrot and they bonk themselves in the head and say, I could have had a V8, right? You guys know that? I, I'm going to hear you. <laughs> I could have had a V8, right? That's what I think of when I hear this parable. Always makes me think of the bonk on the head. I could have had a V8. Because in this story, you've got the elders and chief priests who are obsessing over this question of authority. Where does Jesus get his authority? How dare he do these things? And they're missing out on a moment of transformation, a moment that the tax collectors and the prostitutes, which is basically a way of saying the lowest of the low in their culture, the most disregarded versus 
these who were the most regarded, that they had caught on immediately and never looked back. Head bunk. The experience of regret is something that comes to mind when I think of that. Oh, I could have. And regret is a moment of realization. When you realize that you made choices, that you took action or non-action sometimes, that you wish you'd done differently. It's knowing better and not acting on it. It's a powerful motivator for change in your life also. I had a moment like that of transformative regret. It was when I was doing clinical pastoral education, CPE. It's an internship where you're learning chaplaincy skills. And I was doing mine at a treatment center working with mentally ill, chemically dependent clients. And it was really tough, emotional work. And usually at the end of the day, I was really tired, really exhausted. However, I had told my nephews that I would go to one of their Little League games I was sitting, living in the same area as they lived, and I was going to do this. But whenever the opportunity came up, I didn't go. I'm too tired. Then my 13-year-old nephew dropped dead on the baseball field from a cardiac arrest, from a genetic cardiac um, dysfunction called long QT syndrome. And I was devastated with regret. I said I would be there. I promised I would be there. And then I never went. I never went to a game. And I could have, I could have multiple times, but I didn't go. So as I worked through this regret with a really good grief counselor, I realized that I couldn't change the past, that this regret was not something to hang on to, that I needed to use it, use it to change my future. Use it as a moment of personal transformation. So I made a decision to be there for my other 10 nephews and nieces to make family a greater priority in my life. So I made the four-hour round trip after a long day of work to be there for the homecoming coronations and games, the volleyball tournaments, the music concerts, and the proms. I was there to have my mouth hit the floor when my nephew, who showed absolutely no interest in music ever in his life, got on stage and showed his guitar skills and vocal skills to beat Tim McGraw and Garth Brooks. And I was there when my nephew played in the prep bowl. And I was there to scream at the top of my lungs with the rest of my family when my niece won first place at the State 4-H Horse Show, and then my other niece won High Point Trophy in Games at the very same horse show. I was there with pride when my nephew was pinned a lieutenant in the National Guard. And I even officiated for the weddings of two of my nephews. Every time one of these events occurs, and I'm there, I remember my oldest nephew. And I still feel a twinge of regret, mixed in with a great deal of gratitude. Gratitude for the change that that regret 
created in my life and the values I have because of him. There's a weight loss support group that starts every one of their meetings naming what I call the knowing better problem. They start every meeting by saying, we are all intelligent people. We all know how to lose weight, but we don't always practice what we know we should be do. We don't always practice what we know we should be doing. Paul writes in Romans 7.15 of his struggle with the going better problem when he writes, I don't understand what I am doing, for I don't practice what I want to do, but instead I do what I hate. So we know this problem, and thankfully Jesus has a message for us today that transforms this problem. It can be summed up as this. Regret is a mighty motivator of change, and Jesus is a mighty forgiver of regret. In Matthew 21, 23 through 32, Jesus is confronted by the chief priests and elders about his source of authority for doing these things. So what are these things that he did? Well, he rode into town on a donkey and caused a big ruckus. He tore up the temple and ruined a bunch of businesses. And he posed a challenge to the established authority figures, like the chief priests and elders of the temple. It would seem that Jesus had a problem with authority figures, but I think Jesus had a problem with authority figures who got so caught up in their authority and in their rights and privileges that they forgot deep down they still needed God. Jesus uses the parable of the two sons to emphasize the missing the point point. A son is asked by his father to work in the field, and he says no, then later reconsiders and does as the father asks. Another son is asked to work in the field, and he says yes, but does not go to the vineyard. Instead, he stays away. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out who did the right thing, but this parable isn't about who does the right thing. Clearly, the elders and chief priests would be the people who do the right thing, who are good and uh, in the society that they live in. No, the key in this parable is from the sentence in verse 29. It's not about what is said or done, but the transformation that occurs in between. When the first son says no, there is a little word that shows up in verse 29 that's translated, he changed his mind, or he reconsidered. The word in Greek is metamelomai. It means regret. It is related to the word metanoia, which means to repent to change one's mind, heart, and perception. Both of these words are about change. They're about repentance, turning around from our thoughts and our ways. But in the case of metamaloma, it is not sorrow that motivates our change. It is regret that annoyance at the consequences of one's action or frustration in having known better. That is the Greek word for bunking yourself on the head and saying, I still need God. Oh. 
So the key question in this parable is not who did the right thing. The key question is who did the Father's will? And it's asked because it reveals which son remembered he still needed to be in a relationship with his father. I need to, I still need God. So feeling regret can be a powerful motivator for change in our lives. But there's more because Jesus is the mighty forgiver of regret. He points to the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the lowly of the low and that they remembered that they are in a relationship with God, that they need God, that they believe, and they're promised the kingdom of God, and whatever they regret is forgiven, and they begin a new life. So regret is a mighty motivator for change, and Jesus is the mighty forgiver of regret. So how can that knowledge affect your life today? What do you regret today? And is that a regret you can resolve now? And if not, how can you make a change in your life that would make amends for your regret? But you see, the point... Is that not that you need to save yourself from your regrets, but that you are free to live beyond your regrets, that you don't need to stay stuck in them? Regret is a mighty motivator for change, and Jesus is the mighty forgiver of regret. You are forgiven. Invite you to please pray with me. Dear God, creator, liberator, and enlightener, help us to be the same mind and heart as Jesus, changed and full of new beginnings. Help us to live beyond our regrets. Give us an attitude that lives through tragedies, grows strong with trials. Sees the calm after the storm and faces hopelessness with a look of hope. May we come to the table and receive the bread of life, forgiving our regrets and remembering our Savior, the great forgiver, Jesus. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. We pray for the mission of the gospel. Unite your church in its proclamation and witness. Let the same mind be in us that is in Christ Jesus. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, you provide daily for our nourishment. Bless fields and orchards, oceans and lakes, birds and animals, insects and fish. Sustain those who harvest your life-sustaining bounty. Help us share the gifts you have freely given. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is God of nations, give all your people the mind of Christ. Guide national and international leaders to advocate for policies that look to the interests of the most vulnerable. Humble us when we question your mercy toward those who are different from us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Self-emptying God, stir up compassion for those in need. Send your spirit to those who are in crisis, troubled, weary, or discouraged. We pray especially for Oliver Bartlett, Lynn Starr, Ron Fells, Matt Henry, Father Bob Benita, Myrna Parker, and Chris Snyder. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for our congregation and community. Guide our deliberations over difficult decisions. Strengthen our commitment to our ministries. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious God, we give thanks for the saints whose tongues confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Keep us confident in your promises until we join them in endless praise. We remember especially Jan Schnath. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting the power of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for this time of offering. Good morning. Am I on? Okay. I'm Debbie Corlett, your stewardship chair for this year. Along with Marissa Weaver, Ed Donnell, and Nathan Carlson, we're, today we're introducing our stewardship appeal, which is titled, Make It Simple. So right about now, you're probably think I'm up here gonna ask you for money. You think that's very simple? Because <laughs> I sure don't. While that is our appeal every year, every fall, it's not our only focus. The goal of stewardship ministry is to equip, empower, and grow as children of God, individual stewards, and as a community, responding to God's gifts through the sharing of resources, time, talents, and treasures. It is our gifts, your gifts, be it your time, your talents, and yes, your financial support, that allows Messiah to continue to do what is God's will for our or his ministries. Everything from the pews you sit in to the staff to the numerous 
in-reach and outreach programs here at home and globally, learning opportunities, youth ministries, service projects, could go on and on. You know, last Sunday at uh, one of the forums, Pastor Gina Maria put it quite simply. She said, what is your core passion? What is it that drives you to come to church? Why are you here? Over the next few weeks, we encourage you to give prayerful consideration to that question as you begin to think about your commitment of support. A letter has been placed in your name tag box this morning. You may have already picked it up. If you haven't, please do so as you leave today. Those that aren't uh, picked up will be put into the mail. But in the coming weeks, our Make It Simple theme is going to be shared through videos and temple talks during the offering, as well as through the Tuesday morning Bible study for men. It's at 7 o'clock, and it's led by Harold Zinter. We also have an 11 o'clock Tuesday Bible study that is held for mixed, uh, it's a mixed Bible study, and it's held by Hal Christensen. In addition, on Sunday mornings, we invite you to attend the Discovering God's Mission for Your Life. This is led by Jean Barty and Vicki Donnell, and it's an eight-week program between services, which recently started, but it aligns perfectly with our theme. There is still time to join any of these studies. All of this is going to culminate with Commitment Weekend on November 11th and 12th, when we'll have the opportunity to bring our gifts, pledges forward as we dedicate them in prayer to God's purposes. We will also follow uh, the 8.30 service with a congregational breakfast, so watch more for more information about that. Now, as God stewards the clay combs in the video you are about to view, recognizes that God provides all our needs and that God is always there. They believe that generosity and simplicity are a way of life. With that being said, let me close with this thought. Each morning you wake up, God gives you a full day of opportunities to praise him. He regularly gives us chances to hear, see, and experience his grace, his love, and his power in ordinary, everyday moments. What will you give back to God from the blessings that you have received? Connie and Fred Claycomb operate a vegetable farm and roadside stand along State Highway 220 in western Pennsylvania. The Claycombs are longtime members of Trinity Lutheran Church in Bedford. As the Claycombs teach their grandsons about life on the farm, they also pass on a belief that generosity and simplicity are a way of life. You know, every spring uh, we plant uh, about 10 acres of sweet corn and we rotate pretty much between pumpkins and sweet corn and then we raise some tomatoes and green beans and a few other vegetables. Of all the years we've been farming, we've had to leave very little in the field. We know about what, to, what we're going to sell. Right here, we're next to the largest food distribution system in the United States, Walmart, and also probably one of the smallest, an individual farmer growing vegetables and selling them to local, the local market here. These guys here, both of them, <laughs> both of them love to farm and help pap. So someday it'll be theirs, hopefully. We never close these doors. So this is open 24 hours a day. So there's a basket sits right here on the shelf and it says, please help yourself and put the money in the basket. And that's what we do. To live as a simple family and, and that, it means everything. Uh, I've been all over the world and the best people in the world are the people that live a, a simple life and do not let things get too complicated. Every time our life starts to get complicated, that's when we enjoy it the least. It's, it's difficult in today's society to, to lead what you call the simple life, but there's still enough people in this country and in this world that I think that God still has a plan for us. I mean, I grew up a Lutheran, always went to church, but probably the years that we spent and raised our family have, have showed me that God is always there, a very important component in every little thing you do. He answers all our prayers. Some of them not the way we ask him to be answered, but he always answers our prayers. My wife would give down to the very last thing she had on the table. I'm probably not quite that generous, but she would. 
God is so important to me. He's so real, he's so alive, and he provides every need that I have. You know, we said we lived a simple life and we always had faith in God, but for most of the years that we farmed, it was kind of a struggle financially. The last four or five years, we're much better off. We try to give more to other places in the Lord, but it just seems you can't outgive them. The more you give, the more something comes back. Every day, all day, I get help, and I know that God is just watching over and taking care of my needs. Every day, all day. God of life, you give, you us, give us these, these gifts, gifts of the of earth, the these resources of our life and our labor. Take them offered in great thanksgiving and use them to set a table that will heal the whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and light. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should in all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, O God most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise, call us to your table and grant us your life. When the world was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. 
When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation, David faced Goliath, and the psalmist cried out for healing, and full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. And celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Trusting his presence in every time of place, we plead, Amen. O God, you are breath, send your spirit on this meal. O God, you are bread, feed us with yourself. O God, you are wine, warm our hearts and make us one. O God, you are fire, transform us with hope. O God, most majestic, O God, most motherly, O God, our strength and our song, you show us a vision of the tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such life, the life of the Father and the Son, the life of the Spirit and our risen Savior, life in you now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated at this time. All are welcome to this table. It is a table of forgiveness, and all are welcome who believe in receiving this forgiveness. Invite my assistants to come forward and for you to take a moment of reflection. When you come forward, you may kneel or stand along the railings. You will receive the bread, which you may, and then a cup of either dark liquid, which is wine, or light liquid, which is grape juice, and there is um, gluten-free elements available. Come, let us eat. The body of Christ given for you the body of Christ given for you. Jesus loves you and you are blessed.
communion blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you now and keep you always in his peace. Amen. Holy and compassionate God, in bread and wine you give us gifts that form us to be humble and courageous. May your words come to life in our serving and in our witness, that we may speak a living voice of healing and justice to all the world, through Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. May be seated for announcements. Turn your attention to the message uh, that's in your bulletin. Um, just a couple things to note. Uh, next Saturday will be a memorial service for Jan Schnath. Um, Two o'clock reception, coffee and cookies, fellowship, remembrance, and then three o'clock memorial service. And there also will be blood pressure readings done next week between services. Also, we were to have a Reformation bookstore the next couple weekends, this one, next one, and uh, there, unfortunately, the kit didn't get sent to us, so uh, that is on hold, but it will happen at some point. We just don't know when, <laughs> but we will have one soon. Um, so that is not occurring this weekend. And as you noted, please pick up your stewardship letters that will be in your mailboxes before you go. And the rest I think you can catch up on by taking this home and reading through it. Um, there's another 50 reasons why it's great to be a Lutheran in there. They're always interesting to read. And I think we have an announcement. Good morning. Um, I know everything's in the messenger in the spirit, but I just wanted to go ahead and point out we have several fun opportunities uh, this month to sign up for. This coming Saturday is um, Campbell's Maze Days, with, which is the pumpkin patch, um, and that starts at 530 um, it's a lot of fun. We've done it. I was actually thinking about it. I think I was either pregnant with Michaela or Michaela was a baby when we first started doing this at Messiah. So we've been doing it 10 or 11 years. So it's a lot of fun. It's kind of become a tradition. Um, it starts at 530, but you can come whatever time works for you through the night. It's $7 a person, ages five and up, um, four and under are free. So anyway, there, um, there's a maze, there's a hayride, um, we do s'mores and hot dogs. So if you want to sign up, the sign up sheet's back there, or my number is in the bulletin if you want to um, text me. Also, uh, we have Trunk or Treat, which is the last Sunday in October, which I believe is October 29th. Um, is that right? Okay. That's from four to six in the church parking lot. And um, our goal is to get 20 trunks. So if you can help us out with that, that would be fantastic. Um, it's a lot of fun. You just decorate your trunk really simply. I go to the Dollar Tree and maybe spend five or $10 at most, and you don't even have to spend anything. You can just put some pumpkins in the back of your truck. So that's a lot of fun, uh, or the back of your car. We actually always bring our car. Um, and if you can't help out in that way, if you want to bring some candy, that would be fantastic too. There's also a sign-up sheet for the camp out, which is, I think, in two weeks, and West Bowman's heading that up. So anyway, lots of fun stuff going on. Thank you. So I invite you at this time to receive the benediction. 
Now may the power of God strengthen you, may the love of Jesus Christ heal you, and may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you, now and forever. Amen. Guided by the gospel, 